Hey there, this is Ron Coddington from Military Images Magazine coming to you tonight uh, with Military Images Live. This is season two, episode 21. I want to welcome all of you, uh, especially our new subscribers. We've had a, um, a bunch of you all that have taken advantage of our Black Friday special. I want to say a special welcome to all of you and uh, thanking all of you who are coming on now. Uh, Michael Pissarro is here, uh, Chris Maldonado, uh, among others. While you guys are coming on, I want to also thank our advertisers from the magazine, especially Perry Adams Antiques, who is right here. Uh, Perry Adams is a new, uh, new advertiser, and uh, if you're not familiar with their website, definitely check it out. It's perryadamsantiques.com. And... Uh, Hey, look at here, I have a couple of examples of what they currently have on their site. Uh, one of them is this hat, uh, an epaulette and shoulder strap grouping, uh, a wonderful collection that belongs to Captain Samuel C. Graves of the 8th Massachusetts Infantry. Uh, he served in the Sutton Light Infantry, which became a company in the 8th Massachusetts. Uh, they're also known, we believe, as the Sutton Guards and the Standish Guards, which explains why in the middle of the hat you will see this SG on the infantry horn emblem. So wonderful image. Uh, and here is an image of the captain himself. The photo is not available with the hat, but the rest of the information is. Another item uh, that's currently on Perry Adams is this cap. Really nice McDowell uh, cap from early in the war. If you look on the inside of that cap, you are going to see uh, some writing. And uh, if you look close, you'll see J.J. Peck. That would be this man pictured here. And this photograph does come with the hat. This is uh, Brigadier General John J. Peck. Uh, he was born in 1821, graduated from West Point in 1843 with uh, a fellow cadet by the name of Ulysses S. Grant, uh, went on to fight in the Civil War, well, first fought in Mexico, then fought in the Civil War in the Peninsula Campaign, fought in North Carolina, uh, survived the war and died in the 1870s. So this image, this hat is all available on perryadamsantiques.com. I urge you to check them out. Uh, Bill and Bob, uh, I'm sorry, Bill and Ben are the proprietors. They're great guys and have wonderful merchandise. So check them out. Now, Oh, got a lot of folks on here. Uh, so glad that you all are hanging out tonight. Uh, I want to start out um, with uh, an item that uh, I, uh, it's actually the idea of historical significance when it comes to images. And um, I rarely call out an image and I say, hey, this is really historically significant. In fact, the last time I did so was a few years ago with an image that's owned by Chuck Joyce. And uh, you all may remember this amazing albumin photo, which is a uh, group of men who served in the U.S. Colored Infantry, along with uh, a minister. Uh, you see some musicians here. What makes this image really quite interesting is not only a beautiful composition, but the fact that each man in this photograph is identified. And I believe, if my memory is correct, that six of them were wounded at the Battle of the Crater. So at the time, I said, man, this is a really historical, uh, historically significant portrait and um, one for you all to think about. As part of a way of evaluating images, what is the significance of them? What is the backstory? Well, that was, I believe, in 2016. Now, uh, three years later, I'm going to add a new photo to the list of the ones that I think are really, really historically significant. And here it is. This is the current cover, or I should say, it's not the current cover, it is the cover of the current issue of Military Images. This is our winter 2020 issue. And uh, if you've got it, great. 
uh, if you're a subscriber and haven't, it's on the way. But these two gentlemen in this photograph are brothers. Uh, one served in the Union Army, one served in the Confederate Army. Now, in all my years of collecting, I have never seen an image of a Union soldier and a Confederate soldier that were brothers in uniform. Have you? If you have, definitely let me know uh, because that would be a second. Now, I've heard talk occasionally, um, but this one is a verifiable, genuine ID image of a Union and Confederate soldier. I believe that this image was made about October of 1865. So it was taken after the war, as many Confederate images were taken uh, in those months after the war, because as you know, photographic supplies had largely dried up in the South, and it wasn't until the end of the war that photographic supplies began to trickle back in, and many of the men who served in the Confederacy wanted to pose for one last photograph. And so I think this may be the case here. And the reason I say October 1865 is that these two brothers, uh, Gabe and Ned Folks, um, both from Hickman County, Tennessee, uh, they, uh, they um, ended the war, at least Gabe, the Union soldier, ended the war in, uh, 18, in eight, October of 1865 when he mustered out of his regiment, uh, the 12th uh, Tennessee Cavalry, and uh, went back home. So my thought is that he posed for the photograph around this time. So a wonderfully historical image. And um, again, if you know of another one of two brothers from the Brothers War, let me know. Now, the issue uh, is out, as I mentioned, uh, and um, the issue came out just in time for the Franklin Show in Tennessee. So I was down there, uh, not this last weekend, but the weekend before that, and uh, met a bunch of great collectors, scanned a bunch of images, and also on the way home, I stopped off at another collector's home. It's Malin Nichols, and uh, Malin shared his collection uh, with me, and you'll see highlights of that collection in a future issue. So I thought I would take part of the show to give you a sense of what came out uh, of Malin's collection and from the Franklin show. None of this image has been, none of these images have been seriously researched. So you're seeing it um, pretty fresh and pretty new. And um, I'm gonna start out with some Confederates. Uh, you've got this Virginian. I don't know if you can see it entirely here, but he has uh, three pleats on the front of his blouse and they're tinted green. Uh, I think as Malin would say, these are one of my Virginia boys. More to come. Another soldier, he could be a Tennessee, and I don't have the full story yet, but really what really catches your attention, again, is the front of his uniform. Take a look at the trim. Wow, uh, a pretty serious zigzag trim. If you are familiar with this uniform, I would love to know about it. We haven't started researching it yet, but uh, several folks that I spoke with said, yeah, that looks familiar, but no one could quite tell where they saw it. If you can, let me know. All right. From the uh, Daniel Taylor collection uh, is this Tennessee soldier. He came a little bit too late to be included in the magazine, but we'll research his story and put it in a future issue. Uh, this is Private John Romines uh, of the 19th Tennessee Infantry out of Hamilton County, Tennessee. Uh, a couple things worthy of note. Uh, you can see he carries his Mississippi rifle and uh, he has got that double roller belt that you see connected to a lot of Confederates. He also has an interesting insignia, which appears to be a bit of a cross. Uh, and if I didn't know better, I would say that it's a core badge, but since you don't really see those on Confederate uniforms, I can't quite make it out. Could be purely decorative. Um, I don't know that it is, a, uh, is the Christian cross uh, because the sides look equidistant from each other but uh, quite an interesting image. So look forward to more 
on our private row minds. Here's one from the David Young collection. Now, uh, you've probably seen a lot of Maryland images, Maryland officers from the 1st or 2nd Maryland Infantry, which is also known as the Maryland Line. Uh, this is an enlisted man, uh, super rare. I mean, I, I can't think of the number of times I've, uh, I've seen them. Uh, you'd have to go around and look at some of the great books about Maryland soldiers uh, that are out there. Dave Mark is uh, probably the best known collector. I suspect there may be a few in his book, but wow, a really interesting view of a Maryland Confederate. Here's an image that came in. Uh, this is actually a copy print. Uh, and it's an interesting image to me because it was probably taken in the 1940s, maybe the 1950s. Uh, and uh, the timing of this is really important because when you think about the generations that followed the Civil War and the way that copy prints were made, it's not uncommon to see images that were made during the war uh, if the soldier passed away. But then you see images start to come out in the 1880s, again, and maybe the 1910s and the 1920s, and here in the 1940s and 1950s. And the reason uh, that you see it happening in this cyclical way is fairly straightforward. It's the children, it's the grandchildren, it's the great-grandchildren, and sometimes the great-great-grandchildren. So uh, this print um, belongs to Arston Grant, and um, I'm gonna look on, peek on the back here for the information. Uh, this is Davis Lane Cornwell, Davis Lane Cornwell of the 32nd Georgia Infantry. Now, Arston Grant is looking for the original of this photograph. He has a great print that I mentioned, again, was made in the 1940s or 50s, uh, crystal clear, beautifully done, but Arston would love to find the original image. So if you know where it is, and I'm gonna put it on this Facebook page so you can see it, uh, we wanna connect you with Arston Grant. All right. From the Jim Ingram collection, uh, you can't help but immediately go nuts over this one. Uh, what is going on with that hat? Uh, it's sort of my first thought that we're looking at something that might be from the, um, uh, the Mexican War, the pre-Mexican War. It, it, it vaguely resembles one of those wheel hats. Um, you're also seeing a little bit of... Um, uh, some military, a uh, military belt, uh, these shoulder straps, which are fairly common to militia. Uh, of course, you've got this big brass horn. I don't know my musical instruments as well as I should. Uh, of course, we know that he was part of a band. Um, I'm thinking after talking with Mike Cunningham, who was one of our contributing editors, that this image dates probably from about 1850 uh, and is probably some sort of militia bandsman. Still can't explain the hat. If you've seen one like it, reach out and let me know. Now, while we're on the subject of bands, you've got this guy with a very similar horn. And um, I wanted to call this out because it's a really nice, interesting variation on the bandsman uniforms. Um, those of you who know the Union uniforms of the Civil War period know of the big pleats that go, the horizontal pleats that go across the chest. Well, this guy is not wearing them, but instead he's got these, and here's another image. This guy here is the guy on the left in this photograph. And um, he's got these three really big, um, I, I can't even call them chevrons. They are uh, piping on his cuff uh, with, some, with three buttons along the side there. He's with his buddy uh, who is also I'm assuming a, uh, a militia, or pardon me, either a militia um, soldier um, just about to muster into the federal army. So great image and an in interesting variation on the uniform. What really caught my attention about this image is if you consider the shoulder straps and the piping, and then if you take a step back, and this is probably around 1861, if we go back 
to our uh, 10 years to our 1850 uh, daguerreotype, we see the same idea here. You see the piping on the sleeves and you see the shoulder, um, or I'm sorry, you see shoulder straps that imitate uh, those going on there. So this image, of course, is a bit stronger in the hat, of course, and, um, and the shoulder straps, but this later image really has this one beat in terms of the piping on the cuff. Here's one. We're on a roll with musicians. Uh, here's a bugler. He's a young bugler. I can't imagine he's more than um, 15, maybe 16 years old. Uh, he's part of uh, Adam Fleischer's collection. Uh, Adam shared this uh, during the show. And um, a really, really wonderful image. The uh, backdrop has got a lot going on. You've got a river scene. You've got the stars and stripes, uh, a caisson for a canyon. Uh, you've got a soldier standing over here. Looks vaguely familiar, this backdrop, which is a great time for me to mention to you that uh, Military Images is going to start doing a new column about backdrops. We haven't named it yet, but Adam Fleischer is going to be the author of this new column. So the backstory of this is Adam is taking the lead in wanting to explore backdrops. Um, Adam is a champion of understanding the idea that these backdrops are critically important to being able to place these soldiers and possibly place these soldiers in a certain camp, attach them to a certain photographer. And as a result, we might be able to ID them to a company, to a regiment, to an army corps, um, and hopefully even get their name at some point. So Adam is working on this idea. Um, I'm looking forward to more. And um, our spring issue is the planned, uh, it, we have the plan for the spring issue to be the first installment of his column. Now, this image of the Beagler, at first it reminded me of this photo. This young boy is about the same age and has a similar look. Of course, he's a drummer and not a Beagler. Uh, by Charles D. Fredericks. So I went uh, and did a little bit of research because I was curious to find out a little bit more about Fredericks. He's the New York photographer that you hear a whole lot about. Uh, he was a contemporary of Matthew Brady. He's considered an innovator. He was extremely prolific during the war. And in checking out, learning more about Fredericks, I stumbled upon a magazine that I wanted to mention to you because uh, if you're a student of Civil War photography, uh, photography beforehand and afterhand, you should be familiar with Humphrey's Journal. Um, Humphrey's Journal is uh, published by Samuel Dwight Humphrey. Um, he originally published, it, at least it was called the Daguerrean uh, Journal, I believe, or uh, Daguerrean Photography Journal. I'd have to look that up. But uh, he was an early documentarian on photography. And um, not surprisingly, he often would include anecdotes about the photographers themselves, often about their techniques, but sometimes about other aspects of them. So in this case, uh, Fredericks, who's pictured here, uh, I found, as I was poking around, I found a really great anecdote that I want to read you. This is from Humphrey's Photographic or Journal of Photography, 1869. So we're four years after the Civil War. And um, here's what it says. Uh, he, being Fredericks, occupied the galleries opposite the Metropolitan Hotel in New York City for 20 years. And when they were destroyed by fire, he fitted up at his present place. He now occupies four stories and a basement in one building. Wow, five floors for a photography gallery. And the two upper stories of the one adjoining. So a pretty massive uh, gallery. Uh, Humphrey goes on to say, there are two skylights, one on the first floor used for ordinary portraiture and another on the floor above used for full length figures, groups, and so forth. The dressing rooms, 
I didn't even know there were dressing rooms, but here you go. Um, uh, Frederick's offers dressing rooms for both ladies and gentlemen, and they're beautifully fitted with every comfort and convenience. So I assume he's talking about a dressing room if you wanted to bring a different outfit you wanted to wear or get yourself freshened up and prepared for the photograph, uh, Fredericks had special rooms to do that. And then uh, Humphreys goes on to say, while the operating rooms, so now it's sounding a little bit like a, a modern hospital, the operating room, uh, of course the operating room is where the camera operators were, uh, they're arranged to produce the best effects with the greatest rapidity and the least inconvenience to the sitters. The developing room, which we assume is close by the operating room, is a marvel of completeness and convenient arrangement. Now, this next detail caught me really off guard. And it says, when we remember that Mr. Fredericks takes as many as 170 pictures a day, 170, uh, and at this time of year, our readers can understand that everything must move like clockwork to ensure the success that is evident from an inspection of the work of this great establishment. Uh, it goes on to say, probable this is the largest photographic enterprise in America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, imagine Frederick's gallery, Mr. Frederick's, uh, taking 170 portraits a day, and you figure each person is going to buy at least a dozen uh, by 1869. Uh, do the math. Uh, let's say you buy a couple dozen. We're looking at hundreds of photographs uh, a day, maybe even thousands if you multiply the orders. So that's a huge, huge number. And the reason I was thinking about this uh, when I saw that number is uh, it's an estimate that I made a few years ago about the number of Civil War, of photographs of Civil War soldiers and sailors. My estimate in the Union uh, Army and Navy was that 40 million photographs were taken over a five-year period. And you may have heard me mention this number before. Uh, in the Confederate uh, side, due to the lack of equipment and the lack of chemicals, the displacement of folks in the various parts of the Southern Territory, my estimate is much, much lower. I think that there was probably about 3 million. So 3 million versus 40 million is a significant difference. And uh, so when folks uh, mention the lack of Confederate photographs, um, the real reason for that is simply a matter of scale. When you've got guys like Fredericks operating in 1869, cranking out a uh, hundred sitters a day, imagine during the Civil War, the soldiers filing through uh, his gallery. And that's just one of so many galleries across the North and then of course in the South. So huge, huge, huge numbers in the North versus the South. So keep that in mind as you're looking at photographs. Um, because it makes an incredible difference. Uh, and I think oftentimes on the surface, it makes it look like the Southern soldiers are getting short shrift and not getting as much coverage as the Union soldiers. But the simple fact is, they're just a heck of a lot rarer. So it's also uh, reminds me that it's really important to get it right, to make sure that we're properly identifying soldiers. So the Confederate images and the Union images you see here, the ones that I've showed you tonight from Franklin especially, um, are very much works in progress. It's really important to nail down the backdrops, the uniform details, and try to connect those dots so we can definitely say that you have an identified Confederate or an identified Union soldier. So um, Franklin show continues. Uh, this one, this image, what I'm about to show you, uh, just sort of knocked me for a complete loop. Uh, this is John Halliday, who came up to the table with a cigar box, uh, actually not a cigar box, a tin tobacco box, uh, no more than, you know, maybe the size of being able to hold uh, something a little bigger than a baseball card. Um, what it did hold was all of these CDVs, uh, which are about uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, 20 in number. Um, and you're going to think to yourself, well, Ron, 
Uh, you got a bunch of CDVs, uh, nothing super spectacular about that. Maybe true, uh, but all of these guys are identified and uh, they have something else in common. They're all at Andersonville. When was the last time you've seen a whole stack of uh, Andersonville uh, men who were in Andersonville and some survived and some didn't? So pretty amazing to see that much material from Andersonville in one place. Staying with the prisoner of war theme for just a moment, um, we've got this image here um, from uh, Jack Huroff. And uh, among many things, uh, Jack is a collector. Jack is also a uh, copy editor extraordinaire for military images. The man has the eagle eye and saves me from a whole heck of a lot of embarrassment and catching typos, etc. cetera. Um, he dropped by with this image, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, you've got a guy with slightly worn boots, um, they look like they might be loners or might be new, uh, newer, but his uniform, you can see tears and rents in his fabric. Um, his arm sleeve is torn up, basically pretty beat looking. Might be a couple missing buttons up here, uh, wearing a very uh, rough looking, uh, I wouldn't even call it a slouch hat. I mean, the brim is pulled down. It's obviously been weathered uh, almost beyond wearability standing next to this young man who looks uh, for all the world like he's just been outfitted with a new great coat, uh, nicely tinted blue. I uh, do not know who either of these men are, but uh, it's pretty easy to imagine that you've got a prisoner of war on this side being reunited with uh, a friend. Or in this case, if you look really closely at the image, the resemblance on the faces of these two guys is remarkable. Um, so I dare say that uh, they could be brothers and uh, in this brother's war, they were on the same side. A Couple more to show you. Here's one that, uh, that is a really challenge to get at, uh, to identify. You've got um, a group of guys here it's a really beautiful, it's a big uh, mount with a tin type. Um, could be a full plate. Um, no, actually, maybe a half plate um, tin type. And uh, you've got guys with derbies on, uh, larger top hats. Um, most of them, all of them are wearing some sort of a naval uniform. Um, they've got the bibs. Uh, this guy's got a big anchor in the middle. Uh, on the back is uh, a name, it looks like F.W. Um, Barry Smith or Barry Ann. It's Barry Ann. Um, I don't know if that's the name of one of the men pictured here. I don't know if it's the name of the ship on which they were the crew. But these guys uh, are a challenge to proper, properly identify. Um, Navy folks that I've talked to, guys like Ron Field, um, will tell you that man, you've got uh, rowing teams, which are sort of fraternal organizations, um, and uh, merchant marines that had their own style that they wore. Um, and then, of course, you had the military, Navy in the South and the North. These guys do not at all look like uh, they were in the military. They're certainly naval. Uh, they might have been merchants. Interesting little detail here, and this is worthy of further research that might connect it to the Civil War, is this image came out of Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, if you know Wilmington, Port City, you had a lot of activity. It's the last um, southern port to fall along the Atlantic coast. And so guess what? You've got lots of uh, ships, um, blockade runners that are going in and out of Wilmington. And so the big question is, uh, were these guys part of a crew of a ship that was moving back and forth, uh, eluding the northern blockade? Um, of course, that's, uh, that's hopeful because we don't know the answer uh, right now. But we do have the name Barry Ann on the back, which may be a guide to help us tell the rest of the story. You know, uh, I'm admittedly 
uh, a quality freak. I love images in, uh, in great condition. Um, uh, sometimes images catch my attention. And this one from Mark Krauss, uh, half plate tintype, oh, sorry, half plate ambrotype, we correct that, um, has uh, definitely damage to it. There's some, there's some issues here. You've got some heavy cracking in the emulsion. Um, but as Mark noticed, as he was, or pointed out, as we were talking about this image, which happens to be, by the way, uh, members of Company B of the 33rd Illinois uh, Infantry, uh, look at the way the cracking has formed almost, uh, it looks like it could be part of the backdrop, like tree branches on here. So uh, you hate to see damage to a photograph, but in this case, the damage is uh, quite artfully done. Um, the damage doesn't really obliterate any of the, the images. The soldiers are possibly all able to be identified. If you do a, a magnification, uh, you're going to see his hat brass. And I flipped this around just so you could see the, uh, the hat brass. Um, there's his company B. He's got the 33rd. He's got the horn up there. Um, and the, the focus is it's ab absolutely uh, crystal clear. So fantastic stuff. Um, got uh, one more image that I think, oh, actually two more images I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, one of them is, uh, is this group uh, from the 36th Illinois. This is also from Mark Krause's connection. Those of you who know Mark uh, realize and know that he's a big collector of the 36th Illinois, um, including this soldier, last name of Day, um, I believe Mark has eight images, if he told me correctly. I've scanned them all of day, um, ranging from childhood up until his wartime images. So absolutely fantastic. Here he is with the, uh, with the regimental colors, uh, standing with another soldier. I'm not sure if he's identified, but this is day um, on this side. So, uh, and while we're on the topic of flags, uh, there's this image. Um, which is really uh, uh, quite lovely if you've seen these images before. It's a fairly standard view um, of the flag. What makes this one, to me, really um, uh, special is the handwriting on the back. And um, it says, uh, oh, I should say also, this is from the Carl Sundstrom collection. It's the Regimental Colors of the 31st Illinois Infantry. And uh, on the back, uh, it says, after the identification as the regimental colors of the 31st, it says, five color bearers were shot down, endeavoring to plant it on works near Fort Hill, day of general assault, May 22nd, 1863. It is marked by over 200 bullets. Now, if you go back here, um, you will see uh, you might not see from where you are, but get really up close and you'll see the tiny little holes. It's a miracle to me that the uh, flag is actually still together. It's got rents and tears in it and so many little bullet holes. Now, the back uh, of the photograph mentions 200. I found a regimental sketch um, that doesn't challenge the information, but it does provide a little bit of context. It says uh, that, um, in fact, the 31st was uh, in the Vicksburg campaign. And uh, on May 22nd, 1863, um, they were active around Fort Hill. Uh, they did a participated in a bloody assault. Uh, the colonel was killed by the explosion of a grenade that was thrown while they were planting the regimental colors on the rampart this flag being planted on the rampart of Fort Hill during the Vicksburg campaign on May 22nd, 1863. So here you have the language on the back of the carte de visite is matching this regimental sketch. Um, it does say 153 bullets. Uh, I'm not quite sure how they got to count that, um, but apparently more were added to make it around 200 or they just uh, a little bit of a discrepancy in the number. Um, interestingly enough, uh, it goes on to say, uh, because this occurred on 22nd of May, um, it mentions that the 31st uh, was involved uh, over a month later on June 25th when a mine was exploded. Uh, and the sketch says, uh, there came, this came a time that tested the stuff that men were made of. Here in the night, in that crater remembered as the slaughter pen, 
the soldiers fighting by reliefs and with an arm's length of the enemy. Some had their muskets snatched from their hands under a shower of grenades and of shells lighted by port fires while the voices of various officers rising above the terrific din of combat cheered on their men. There were deeds of valor performed which would adorn the heroic page. Uh, of course, this flag was in the middle of all that. One final note that relates to this image. On the morning of July 4th, 1863, for those of you who know, that was the day that uh, Pemberton surrendered, surrendered the garrison of Vicksburg. Uh, it says, the place of honor having been assigned to the brigade, the 31st Regiment marched proudly across the rents and chasms of Fort Hill into Gettysburg. Pardon me, <laughs> Vicksburg. Uh, so there you have it, the backstory on this image. Uh, so when you look at it, the first thing you think of is, wow, it's uh, another of the many images of flags, which are uncommon, but they're out there. But when you get the backstory and realize that this flag appears to be uh, the first, one of the first flags to march into Vicksburg, that really adds some dimension to it. So I'm going to let you go. I have even more. I uh, haven't got to it all tonight, but we'll save it and uh, talk about it on the next episode of Military Images Live. A big thank you to all of you for supporting this program, supporting our advertisers, uh, for subscribing. Uh, we're rare, as you know, as a community. Not all communities have a, a magazine uh, that's dedicated to this hobby and to telling stories and uh, showcasing, interpreting, and preserving these images, but we have one. And um, much like I feel like I'm a caretaker of images that I collect, I'm also a caretaker of this magazine, of this publication. So uh, I thank you for supporting what we do. Um, if you're not a subscriber, please uh, do that. Let's make it happen. Um, your support is really critical to helping us support the magazine, the ongoing support. Uh, our Black Friday special is extended, um, probably go through uh, as long as we can with it until we have, until we run out of uh, issues to send you. Um, so uh, please take a moment to subscribe. If you don't, if you value what you're watching here, uh, please take a moment to subscribe. And uh, gosh, it's been a real pleasure to be here tonight. We've been off for about a month or so between Thanksgiving and the Franklin Show, so I'm happy to be back. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. So thanks for everything. Take care. Happy hunting. And uh, we'll see you soon. Good night.